All right. I think we're ready to do this. Emily, right. are you there? Are you talking to me? I am talking to you. Oh, hey. Yeah, I'm here. Are you there? Uh, yeah. You want to do a Chai Hack Night tonight? Let's do a Chai Hack Night tonight. Tonight. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Derek Eater, uh, president at Chai Hack Night, and uh, happy to welcome you to our 407th episode of Chai Hack Night, uh, Chai Hack Night Remote Edition. Uh, tonight, we're really excited to uh, welcome uh, an awesome presenter, uh, one of uh, Chicago's aldermen, uh, Alderman Matt Martin, to talk about uh, a topic that's, uh, I'm sure, on a lot of people's minds, uh, police reform in Chicago, why it's taking so long, and what we can do about it. Um, Emily, you want to uh, say hi and talk about some of the things that are going on tonight? Sure, yeah. Um, I'm Emily. I'm also happy to welcome you to Shy Hack Night Remote Edition even though I'm not the president of Shy Hack Night, but I still feel a lot of welcome towards you. Um, and so tonight we'll be having um, what is sure to be a fascinating and timely presentation. And then we hope that you're gonna stick around afterwards for some live Q&A, as well as the civic hacking portion of the event. So for the Q&A, we'll be taking questions via our YouTube live chat. And as a friendly reminder, our code of conduct uh, will be strictly enforced. And we do ask for your respect and consideration in posting appropriate questions. I know that you'll do appropriate questions. I believe in you. Awesome. Should we uh, move on to announcements then? Yes, we should. All right, why don't you take the first one? All right, so Shy Hack Night is a weekly event that is currently and for the time being uh, remote. So you can join it from the comfort of wherever you happen to be. So we have some awesome presentations coming up, including from WBEZ, from Cook County Public Defender Amy. Uh-oh, didn't try to pronounce that last name beforehand, so I'm not gonna, going to. Um, but you can read it on the screen. And also from our 49th Ward Alderwoman, Maria Haddon. Oh, yeah, some great presentations coming up. Um, next uh, announcement, this is something that I uh, read about a couple of days ago from uh, the Justice Tech Download, which is a great newsletter. Um, the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation just published an Atlas of Surveillance, uh, which is a, a huge effort nationwide to document the technologies used by police departments uh, across the country. So you can zoom in. Uh, the screenshot shows you uh, a zoomed in area of Chicago and surrounding suburbs, and you can see the kinds of technologies that are being used there uh, as is documented by the EFF. So uh, that uh, URL is atlasofsurveillance.org. Uh, and you can check out the map there. Oh, very cool. Also, important note, please fill out your census and also tell everyone you know to do it too. It's so fast, so fun. You can go to my2020census.gov and we are lagging behind a little bit in our response rates to date. Um, the census is really important for determining what kind of federal funding Chicago gets and specific areas in Chicago get. So this is super important. If there are people that are hesitant to fill out the census, please encourage them to do so. Right on. I think the last one is just a reminder that after the live stream, we'll be doing uh, a Zoom call that will be uh, open to anybody. And it'll be a place for folks to do introductions, do a little socializing, uh, share um, more announcements that uh, are from the community, and then a place to um, uh, talk about breakout groups uh, and pitch breakout groups. Um, so uh, we'll put that link back up uh, at the end as well so you can uh, remember where to go to it, but it's a uh, bit.ly slash CHN dash remote Zoom. So I think that's it. Uh, we are happy to uh, welcome uh, Alderman Matt Martin to talk about police reform in Chicago. Matt, are you there? I certainly am. Can you hear me? I can. All right. Well, uh, go ahead. Uh, you can get your slides up. Uh, Emily and I will fade into the background and then we will see you for Q&A. That sounds great. So bringing up my slide deck right now. Um, so great. Uh, first of all, huge thank you to Derek, to Emily, Josh, and the rest of the Shy Hack Night family for inviting me to, to uh, speak tonight. And I wanted to focus on police reform, always a timely subject here in Chicago. Um, and 
no more so the case than over the last several months. Um, I, I wanted to share with you all some insights that I've been able to glean both before I joined off joined the city council as well as over the last year plus because I joined city council not too long ago in May 2020. Um, so share some insights, answer some questions, as well as um, share some perspective in terms of where we're heading um, on this important topic. So um, I want to talk a little bit about my relationship with police reform. So um, like a lot of folks, um, really thrust into the spotlight for me in November of 2015 when the murder video of Laquan McDonald was released publicly. And I remember exactly where I was when I viewed that video, just like I remember where I was when I viewed the video depicting the murder of George Floyd. And for me, that was an incredibly galvanizing moment. I was finishing up work at a law firm about to start a clerkship, a paid internship with a federal appellate judge here in Chicago, knowing that a good portion of what that docket would be focused on was uh, criminal cases, issues around sentencing, issues around um, uh, uh, alleged unconstitutional searches and seizures. And in that video and its aftermath um, was really, I think, instructive for me and gave me an additional sense of purpose when it came to the work that I would be doing, not just then, but uh, uh, in the coming years. So my clerkship, it lasted for pretty much the entirety of 2016. And at the end of that year, um, as I imagine everybody will recall, Donald Trump was elected. That was a a really important moment for police reform here in Chicago because leading up to that time, you had the Department of Justice doing a very thorough uh, inner investigation of the Chicago Police Department and some other related public safety entities in Chicago. Um, and uh, shortly after um, Donald Trump was elected right before he was inaugurated, January, uh, that DOJ under President Obama issued a very scathing 160 page investigation report talking about soup to nuts, the ways in which policing and public safety more generally was broken in our city. Um, the fact that we transitioned shortly thereafter to President Trump and then Attorney General Sessions, really important because both the president and the Attorney General at that time were completely uninterested in continuing the Obama administration's work around police reform, not just here in Chicago, in Baltimore, where they were a little bit further along in their police reform, the administration tried to get out of the consent decree that had been entered, um, that, that had been posed to a federal judge there. Thankfully, that judge stood their ground and said, no, we're absolutely moving forward with this. Here in Chicago, it was a different situation. We had the report, but the question was what we we're going to do with it. Um, at that time, Rahm Emanuel was our mayor and his administration was actually working with the Trump DOJ around what was called a memorandum of understanding, not a binding consent decree, um, but something where the federal government would have the opportunity to come in and sue the city if it felt like the city wasn't reforming itself. But I think um, we have a very long and sad history of the city being well aware of the problems involving police misconduct and how rampant they've been, but that cont when continually faced with those, um, those truths, the city government has not been up to task. And so that's why on this timeline, I wanted to take you all back to June 26 to July 31st, 1972. Then Congressman Ralph Metcalf convened a series of hearings for, I believe, during that uh, week long or month long period. And at the end of that issued a report um, talking about the problems with regard to accountability or lack thereof within the police department. So you're talking about an almost 50 year period where we have problematic, hugely problematic incidents like Laquan McDonald murder um, that thrust police reform to the forefront of the conversation here in the city, you have a report that comes as a result, series of recommendations, and we don't do anything. Um, this time, however, it's going to be different. Um, so when the Trump administration stepped away, 
my former boss, Lisa Madigan, when she was the attorney general for the state, stepped in our office, sued the city of Chicago to bring about the sorts of reforms that the Obama DOJ had identified, but the Trump administration wasn't willing to move forward uh, with. So I'll be talking about the consent decree shortly, but I, I worked on that case very closely. I, I wrote the complaint that our office filed against the city found the experts that our office relied upon to help bring us up to speed in terms of best practices and where things should move forward with ultimately the consent decree. And I helped draft significant portions of that, especially around accountability. Um, that was a big reason why I decided to run. I felt like there are too many folks throughout government over the last several decades who just haven't been fighting enough, haven't been hearing what folks are continually saying, whether they're protesting or not, the clarity of conviction, the clarity of what we need to be seeing moving forward from our, our government officials, our government leaders. And I felt like I would have um, an important perspective to provide given the work that I was doing, was fortunate win, to win and really fortunate to continue working on this issue as a member of city council. So, some of the most significant components of police reform I list right here. So we're talking about the consent decree, which I'm about to go into. We're talking about police misconduct lawsuits, how expensive those are for the city. We're talking about our collective bargaining agreements with our supervisors, as well as our line officers, civilian oversight over our police department. We've got two proposals that we're considering at city council right now, CPAC and GAPA. We have the increasingly important role that our inspector general's office is playing. And then finally issues around the budget, especially as it pertains to the police department. So that consent decree that I mentioned, it is a very long settlement agreement, essentially. It's 266 pages, almost 800 paragraphs that talk about the sort of issues that the police department and other entities in our public safety constellation need to improve and need to improve quickly. There are timelines built in there. So we're talking about um, how recruitment occurs, um, training, supervision, how officers are held accountable when misconduct occurs, the sort of policies that officers are trained on and held accountable regarding. We're also talking about data management, um, which I'll get into with a little bit more specificity, as well as the sort of mental health resources that we need to make available to offer officers, um, which uh, we received another sad reminder about that today, uh, learning about um, uh, CPD members' uh, suicide, tragic suicide. Um, this document was uh, finalized January 31st um, of last year. However, there were several years of negotiations. So this is something that's been in the work for several years to date. So we've had, uh, it's been in place for a little over a year now. And the consent decree requires the independent monitor. So it's an individual, um, a lawyer in this case, who has a team of experts and other attorneys who report directly to the judge saying, here are the ways in which CPD and the other city entities are on track with cons uh, consent decree compliance, and here's where we're not. Um, to date, we're about a year in, we've missed over 70% of our deadlines, very worrisome. Um, and I think we're gonna start to see some substantive changes to how compliance with the consent decree is working because it's envisioned to be about a five year process, at least according to the consent decree. Experiences in other jurisdictions, however, it's probably going to be closer to double that, um, closer to 10 years. So whether we're talking about five years or 10 years, you're talking about maybe 20% of the way in, 10% of the way in, we're missing 70% of our deadlines. Definitely not where we need to be. We need to be expecting better. Um, about two weeks, city council Public Safety Committee specifically is going to be holding the first in a series of hearings around consent decree implementation because those independent monitoring reports that I mentioned just a minute ago, those come out every six months approximately. So I introduced legislation that would have us um, as a city council have subject matter hearings in response to each one of those reports because they're critical. There's lots of high level things. There are lots of low level things. We need city council to be active and engaged to make sure that it's holding um, the police department, the mayor's office, the law department accountable. One thing I, I, I wanted to call attention to that the consent decree does that I, I think a number of the, um, uh, the participants are uh, the in today's conversation will be interested in is a revamped early intervention system, an EIS system. 
The idea behind that is that there are certain incidents where maybe they don't rise to the level just yet of needing discipline, but it's maybe the first um, uh, part of what might ultimately be a problematic trajectory that certain officers are on. So if, if certain things are happening within a particular frequency, say problematic complaints that are occurring over two or three months, um, that this early intervention system would be tracking that color coding that. So you can imagine a situation where a supervisor, part of their responsibility, looking through the EIS database as it pertains to the officers within their span of control, saying, hey, is someone coded as a yellow? Like there's some cautionary issues going on here or a red. We really need to take an officer aside, look at what's going on. Maybe additional training is necessary. Maybe there's something going on in their personal lives that we should be concerned about. Maybe there's something else indicating that they're just not a good fit, that we'd be able to address those things quickly uh, and immediately before it spirals into an especially problematic situation of someone getting hurt and the city being on the hook as a result for uh, a potentially large amount of money. So what one of the things that the consent decree also aims to do is to provide more consistent data reporting in a transparent fashion, not unlike what great organizations like the Invisible Institute are doing with um, that Institute Citizens Police Data Project. So that's something where um, they take uh, data that has been uh, obtained from the department, oftentimes through FOIA, and they're looking at uh, alleged and actual violations. We're talking about use of force, illegal searches, personnel violations, and you can search that based on geography. Where did those alleged or actual instances of misconduct occur? What type of complaints are we talking about? What was the outcome of an investigation if one actually occurred? And then demographic information in terms of officers as well as the complainants. And so that's something where folks from outside of government can use this information, be they reporters, academics, regular residents who are just interested in what's going on with our police department and check to make sure that folks are being held accountable. And if they're not, it's an independent check on what city government should be doing, should certainly be doing a better job of, but hasn't historically. Oops. Um, so second big issue, police misconduct lawsuits. We have been paying tremendous amounts of money for several decades now in ways that are just not sustainable. So in 2018, um, we spent about $113 million on police misconduct lawsuits, a little over $80 million on settlements and judgments themselves. The remainder um, are, are litigation costs, specifically attorneys for the city. That it's, it's a number that is mind boggling in part when you compare it to our other peer cities. So New York and LA combined on an annual basis don't pay out what we pay out with regard to our police misconduct lawsuits, just to indicate, indicate how uniquely problematic a situation it is here. Um, and to kind of broaden that out, if you're looking over say the last uh, two or so decades, we've spent well over $300 million on these lawsuits. So this is the sort of thing where, look, um, we understand with the city this size that there are often situations that will arise where the city's gonna be on the hook for something. So certainly the police department is not alone in that regard, but the amount of money and the sort of pain and anguish um, that that money is associated with in terms of those instances of misconduct, it, it's just uniquely problematic and really demands more attention from city council. Um, we're starting to exercise those muscles in an encouraging way. One thing I'd call folks attention to is um, a, a recent case that, a current case that recently came before the finance committee. Um, it was a FOIL lawsuit that was brought by a gentleman with the last name of Green, who was looking for um, uh, FOIA records uh, around instances of officer complaints um, for the period of, let's see, 1967, if memory serves, all the way up through 2015. So the city was proposing that we settle that case for $500,000 in exchange for not providing that information to the gentleman, um, which I understand if someone's in a situation where they determine, look, um, 
the settlement is, is something that I want to move forward with. I don't want to pursue that lawsuit. I can appreciate that. But also the broader context we find ourselves in is one where we need to ensure that the public can trust city government and the police department more than it does right now. And a big way of bringing that about is making sure that we're doing a better job of transparency and so that we're not doing things where it appears that we're paying someone off so that we don't have to provide that information. Um, thankfully, my colleagues work with the administration are, are trying to find a way where we can proactively provide that information that was being sought via FOIA so that those complaint records can be made available publicly. I think that's critically important right now that we demonstrate that we're not going to shy away from opportunities to be more transparent, to provide information for folks to hold us accountable. Um, so my hope and expectation is that within the next month or two that we'll have something to share with the public in that regard that we can be proud of and is something that um, was not done in prior years and prior decades. So wanting to shift gears a little bit to our collective bargaining agreements. So these are the sorts of contracts that the city enters into with two main groups of unions. We've got the union that represents our supervisors, specifically our sergeants, our captains, our lieutenants. Then you have another union, the FOP, that represents our rank and file officers, the beat cops, if you will. Um, what a number of recent reports, not just the DOJ report had indicated, but also the Police Accountability Task Force report that uh, 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 Mayor Lightfoot, before she was mayor, had chaired, really called into question um, a number of problematic provisions and emphasized the need to revise those. One was a ban on anonymous complaints in both of those contracts. It actually was something where we were investigating a number of anonymous complaints, but not with the sort of frequency that was necessary um, and sometimes in a haphazard way. Um, there's another provision that says if someone, even if we know who they are, but they don't uh, sign a sworn affidavit involving the allegations that they want to bring involving officer misconduct, that that was something that too often was not investigated, that there would have to be an affidavit override process that one would adhere to, and too often those weren't even sought. That that's changing right now such that we are investigating more allegations where we don't have a sworn affidavit, but it's still something that has been a hurdle. Uh, another one, and I'll be quicker, the complainant's name, someone who's alleging um, uh, officer misconduct, uh, there's a requirement that their names be provided in advance, well in advance of um, investigations occurring. That's problematic for a number of reasons, including we don't want to chill folks from coming and sharing information around alleged misconduct for fear of, uh, of, of reprisals occurring. Um, finally, uh, prior history, specifically on uh, complaint history, uh, there was a provision up until recently that required that disciplinary history be uh, destroyed after five years. The Illinois Supreme Court recently stepped in and said, nope, we're not doing that. That's not sound policy. So thankfully, that's, that's changed. And then lastly, a uh, rule that there be a 24 hour period in which an officer who has shot somebody does not have to answer questions. I think that's part of the code of silence that has been all too common within our police department and um, reducing that um, 24 hour period significantly is something that we need to have happen. The final thing I'll say with regard to these collective bargaining agreements, we city council recently passed um, an ordinance approving a new collective bargaining agreement for our supervisors union, which makes um, some some meaningful progress with some but not all of these points. Um, I think where we ended up was tolerable. We had some modest success, but it's something where we need to be pushing in successive agreements for even more um, robust transformation with regard to these agreements, because that's one of the biggest impediments to being able to hold folks accountable when misconduct does occur. Civilian oversight over the police department, a huge topic of conversation, something that my office has uh, received a lot, a lot of questions and comments regarding and over the last several months. So we have two organizations, two um, proposals that we're currently considering. One is uh, CPAC, the um, Civilian Police Accountability Council, and then the other is the GAPA proposal, Grassroots Alliance for Police Accountability. Um, I will 
say at a high level that what they're trying to do um, is substantially similar in terms of final policy making and approval um, over new policies with regard to CPD and COPA, the uh, entity that investigates the most serious allegations of officer misconduct, um, that they have a say in terms of the hiring and firing of critical in the, uh, positions, including the police superintendent, um, that they have a budget floor so that they can be adequately resourced the way that our inspector general's office is. Uh, but there are some uh, notable differences between the two. So a number of my colleagues and I are talking with both groups, figuring out where those differences lie. Are we talking about policy issues? Are we talking about legal considerations? So if folks have some questions um, about one or both those proposals later on in the Q&A portion, I'd be happy to get into more detail in that regard. The Inspector General's Office, as I indicated earlier, this is an office that is taking a, a real leadership role in terms of what uh, accountability oversight reform look like here in Chicago. Um, a number of the important functions they provide are one, regular audits and reviews of aspects of our public safety system. So we're talking about police overtime, we're talking about the gang database and how that's broken. We're talking about, um, uh, let's see, ways in which, uh, in which we're engaging with juveniles who have been arrested, um, as well as school resource officers, so police officers who are assigned to particular schools. Those are just some of the many issues that we're receiving robust reports on from the Inspector General's office, as well as some recommended next steps. Um, those reports are critical and um, are being uh, led by a uh, a relatively new Deputy Inspector General for Public Safety, a position that was created in the wake of the Laquan McDonald murder video being released. Um, so that position is gonna be a critical one in the coming months and years to continue shining a spotlight on the ways in which we can improve our public safety entities. The Inspector General's office also can receive complaints that would result in investigations and in certain situations, conduct investigations itself. Um, and one of the situations in which it did that were involved a number of the officers who were involved in uh, Laquan McDonald's murder, including the cover up of that murder. Finally, some of the most exciting work that I think the Inspector General's office is doing right now is around a data portal. So you'll see on um, the, the graphic to the right, um, if you go to igchicago.com, look for their information portals, it pertains to public safety, click through there. It's, it's really tremendous stuff where you can go through, play around with a lot of important data, whether it concerns arrests, what types of arrests, where they're occurring, sorts of complaints that folks are um, sharing with regard to CPD personnel, as well as uh, figuring out how many sworn officers we have, where they're located, which is an uh, increasingly important question that folks are asking in the context of CPD's budget. Which brings me to the next point. Um, this has been something that we've received a lot of questions and concerns about over the last several months, particularly following um, the start of protests in response to George Floyd's murder, among other murders. Um, as some folks might know, we, we have about an $11 billion city budget, um, but many, many aspects of that budget um, are line items that have to be spent on particular issues. So we don't have a lot of discretion. There's a notable exception with regard to our corporate fund, which uh, for 2020 was about $4.4 .4 billion. So that's the sort of fund where we largely have say over how we wanna allocate those funds, regardless of um, what sort of restrictions might be put in place with other um, revenues that the city obtains, whether it's from the state government, the federal government, or otherwise. CPD, as a lot of folks on, on this call will know, uh, receives about 40% of that $4.4 .4 billion discretionary fund, significant, significant portion. Um, that's used in part to employ just under 13,000 personnel. And some of the things that merit additional attention is the fact that last year during budget hearings, when we were asking a lot of questions of our police department, we learned that at a point in time during the budget negotiations, 
there were so many vacant positions in CPD that they totaled $40 million, which is an enormous sum of money. And so maybe that number would go up or go down depending on the time of year and the number of vacancies in general, but you're still talking about a sum of money that dwarfs what we spend for the Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection, what we spend on mental health, what we spend on affordable housing. Um, so making sure that we're doing a deep dive into CPD's budget is going to be critical um, in the coming weeks and months as we lead up to uh, the budget season. Um, I personally believe that we badly need to reimagine what that budget looks like, that we need to be asking more consistently, what are CPD's core competencies? Do we have a staffing analysis that helps us understand the ways in which um, the staffing lines up with those core competencies. Um, my understanding is generally we don't have that staffing analysis and that's something that needs to change because when we're talking about addressing the root causes of crime, which I think the city needs to do a much better job, we're talking about instability in a lot of different ways. Mental health instability, um, housing instability, job instability, education instability, food instability. Um, we need to make sure that um, we are allocating our precious resources in ways that will help us directly address those um, systemic inequities, those, um, those, those real root causes, those indicators of, um, of concern um, throughout our city. And so when I think about what that looks like, it's looking to what some other cities are doing across the country. So there are places in Oregon and Eugene among others where they've adopted a program called CAHOOTS, which um, in short, it says we'll have a paramedic and then typically like a mental health professional, someone who's a social worker, um, they'll be in an ambulance. And uh, um, when someone calls 911, depending on the complaint, that that, that um, ambulance might be dispatched and that we see tremendous results in that regard in terms of it's very rarely the case where someone in that ambulance will ultimately call for, for backup from police, indicating that a lot of situations where they're dispatched, it's um, something where you don't need armed personnel um, to respond to the complaints. So um, if we're talking in Chicago around mental health issues, if we're talking around traffic complaints, noise violations involving residents, or, um, or businesses, are those the sorts of things where a police officer is uniquely well situated to respond to that? We need to be asking those questions and be getting um, much more fulsome responses than has been the case thus far. So that's something that my office is working on closely. Um, final thing I'd say in terms of our budget is that it's really hard historically to figure out what's in there because that information is made available, not just to alders in a robust way, but also to the public. So another reason why the Inspector General's office is doing great work is that through one of their other portals, you can play around with data involving um, the, the city's budget so that if you wanna mix and match, um, for example, what's going on, let's see if this works quickly. Um, if you want to figure out how many personnel, no, this is a little slow, um, what's going on? So like the office of the mayor right here, how many, how much money are we talking about? How many personnel? Same thing with the inspector general's office, city council, for example, um, department of housing. So you can scroll through here, um, do it by year. It goes back several years, thankfully. Um, just gives you the sort of uh, functionality, especially for the public, where there's going to be a much more meaningful give and take, um, not just between city council and the mayor's office around the budget proposal, but also between the public and their elected officials, which I think is really healthy, particularly as we know we're in very austere budget times, that um, we have perhaps a $700 million budget deficit that COVID has created just for this year, the current budget year in 2020, and that next year we're talking about a billion plus dollar um, uh, deficit. So we're, we're gonna have a number of really challenging decisions to make as a city council. And it's more important than ever that we provide the public with data to help us make those decisions. Um, so why don't I leave it there? Those are some of my uh, high level uh, thoughts around where there are problems, where there's an opportunity for improvement. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, a Q&A and answering uh, questions that folks have. Wonderful, thank you uh, so much. Yes, we have many questions. Um, as a reminder, before we get into that, um, 
If folks would like to have a question asked, please type it into the live chat and then we will uh, work it into our list of questions here. So go ahead and start typing those out. Uh, Emily, you wanna take the first one? Absolutely. So the first question that we have is, can the aldermen talk about defund the police movements in other cities and how this is playing out in Chicago? Great question. We're watching that very closely, especially with some of our peer cities like LA and New York. Um, what we've seen thus far, I think are mixed results depending on what you're interested in seeing. So um, with regard to New York, you've seen a real commitment to reduce police overtime, which I think is important um, because when overtime is really running right amok, that's an indication that you don't have the sort of internal controls in place and that um, you have individuals who um, either don't have sufficient guidance or might be abusing a system to the tune of dozens of uh, millions of dollars. Um, you also see a situation in New York where I believe they say that they're reducing the police department budget, but in part it's because they're shifting their version of school resource officers from the police department over to the education department. So it's kind of a slight of hand in some ways. Um, they, I believe also are considering if not, have, if, if they haven't already adopted um, uh, maybe a ban or a slowdown on, on new hiring. Um, so that that's something that we'll we'll see to what extent we want to adopt that here in Chicago. I think we want to move beyond some of those top lines. Over time, has been something that we've been talking about consistently, including last year. Um, I think we spent uh, over almost 140 million dollars on overtime, despite budgeting only 95 million dollars, which is still way too high. This context, I think, in about 2010 or 2011, we had budgeted. $27 million for overtime. So we've seen that go up by a factor of three to four, depending on the year. Um, but I, I think we can do a better job. We've got a little bit more runway here in Chicago. We can see what these other cities are doing, which is critical. My understanding in LA, I, I haven't followed up over the last week or two, but there was a commitment to just decrease it by a particular percent or a particular amount of money. Um, but I think it's really important for people in positions like mine to hear what folks are saying and translate that into policy. And that's why I brought up cahoots because look, we'll have a lot of folks throughout the city who feel very strongly that the police department funding is not um, in line with our values. But there are also folks, including some of my colleagues who have real concerns with safety in, in their communities. They see um, gun crime spiking in some ways. And as a result, some folks will say, well, not unlike the school resource officer issue, if you're giving me the option of like more officers or nothing, I'm going to choose more officers because at least there's something going on there. And I can, I can appreciate that concern where people are thinking, well, um, at least that's someone, someone from the city who can respond uh, to a call for service. But again, I think that it's important that folks in my position ask the question, well, what sort of calls for service are, there, are they being asked to respond to? Um, does it have to be a police officer? Would it instead be better to have somebody else there, especially when we're talking about problematic incidents of officers escalating when they should be de-escalating instances involving crisis? Um, also begs the question of just what are, what are other ways to maintain and enhance safety throughout the city? And that looks, um, that, that's different things in different places. But I think you look at entities like Cred and Ready, where they're identifying individuals who are at high risk of being involved with gun crime. They uh, provide those individuals access to cognitive behavioral therapy to the extent that they have trauma, that they could use some professional help in, in, in navigating, that they have access to paid job training, and that at the end of approximately 16 to 18 months, you've got a decent paying job um, that you can look forward to. And so that's, I think, what we need to be exploring more when we're talking about the sort of public safety investments that'll help us tackle the root causes of crime. And so if we did a better job of, as city council members of workshopping those ideas, sharing them with colleagues, sharing them with the mayor's office, sharing them with residents, I think that it wouldn't be um, as problematic a conversation is, is happening in some parts of the city of um, folks equating officers with safety and to not have officers or not have enough officers. That means that we don't have the requisite amount of safety. I just think really that there's a lack of imagination and a lack of information and planning with regard to 
what that actually looks like. And the final thing I'll say in that regard is when you look at places like even Dallas, where our current um, superintendent came from, the per capita spending on the police, um, the number of officers per capita, much lower than what we have here in Chicago. And, and no two cities, it's a, it's a completely perfect comparison, but it just goes to show that we've got a lot of ways where we can learn from what other cities are doing. And that while we're unique and we pride ourselves on being that second city and there's nothing like Chicago in good ways, um, that doesn't mean that we wall ourselves off to information that other peer cities can share in terms of best practices. Thank you. I'll take the next one. Uh, what types of support are police officers themselves given right now when it comes to addressing misconduct within their own ranks? So that's something that the consent decree is working on because prior to that taking effect, and especially prior to the Laquan McDonald murder video um, getting released, we were doing a really bad job in that regard. Is And the Department of Justice's investigation report laid that out in excruciating detail. So we're talking about officers who weren't getting adequate training on things like de-escalation, crisis intervention, not just when they were at the academy, but especially when they were when they graduated. And so it's called in-service training. Just think about like annual training that a lot of folks get in their various um, professions. And so we're bumping up the number of hours, um, slowly ramping up. And I think right now in 2020, we're talking about 24 hours annually of in-service training and it's specific subjects um, that need to be covered sometimes annually, sometimes every other year. And that those uh, training curricula and policies that you're training on, that they have to be approved before going into effect by the attorney general's office, by the independent monitor that reports directly to the federal judge. So I think those sorts of um, robust and consistent trainings are critical. Um, and part of what you're getting trained on is the fact that these policies do exist, that you have these processes in place in terms of what accountability looks like so that officers know what happens when they um, engage in inappropriate conduct, um, that they hopefully will be held accountable, and that there's also a duty uh, for officers who have witnessed misconduct to bring that to the attention of superiors and or investigators. Because when we're talking about the code of silence, um, that we need to break down. Um, I think it's a responsibility that everybody needs to have. So it's not something that's gonna change overnight, but I think the sort of training and supervision that need to occur, it's gonna be aided by technology, like the early intervention system that I mentioned earlier, body cams, and the fact that you're supposed to activate those every time you have um, an interaction with a member of the public, all the way to how our accountability systems work. I think in the aggregate, um, present some important paths forward for uh, how we're going to improve the trust between the police department and our communities. Awesome. Thank you for answering that. I'll take the next question. So you mentioned that it was reported that the Chicago Police Department had missed 71% of deadlines for the consent decree reforms. So I'm curious, what additional steps is the city going to take to achieve compliance? And are there any real consequences other than bad press for missing these deadlines? Yeah, yeah, really important issue um, because we're just not getting the job done as a city. Um, in terms of what the next steps are gonna have to be, I think the first monitoring report, which came out like six months in, um, or it covered the first six month period, you know, like I, I, I took that to be, sharing like some some warning signals, excuse me, that should be going off toward to, to leaders saying we need to do stuff differently. The second report, I think really laid bare, hey, we are not, we're not getting the job done. We are not seeing the sort of progress. Um, if anything, we're seeing a continuation of the problematic um, processes in place, especially around um, a failure to engage the community with regard to policy creation before, um, uh, uh, those policies go, uh, go, are, are finalized, as well as a failure to share information in a prompt way with the Attorney General's office and the monitoring team so that they can judge whether compliance has occurred. So um, one of the big next steps is in about two weeks, we're going to be holding a, a hearing on the consent decree. And so uh, I plan on asking a lot of questions um, to uh, leadership at the police department, at COPA, the um, uh, police board, um, what's, what are the reasons 
for why this is this has not gone the way that we need it to go. Um, have there been shakeups in terms of leadership? Um, what sort of reassessments are in plan are, are being planned in terms of how to just set up processes differently? Because um, if we don't see a, a better job, like in many ways a 180, um, you're going to have the federal judge step in and just explicitly mandate that X, Y, and Z happen. So it's not bad press, it's actually a federal court stepping in and saying, this is what you're gonna do. We've seen that throughout the country in some other instances, I think when you're talking about the civil rights movement, um, desegregating certain public institutions, a little bit more recently with regard to um, segregated housing, um, judges um, in various parts of the country have stepped in and said, this is this is what a city's going to do when it has just demonstrated a, a, an inability or an unwillingness to uh, engage in a meaningful way. So I sincerely hope we don't get there. Um, but look, it's on everybody, myself included. Um, you see stuff like that. It's not sufficient that um, you say a few unkind things on Twitter <laughs> in terms of our progress or lack thereof. It's about asking some really pointed questions and then being having a seat at the table and making some suggestions in terms of based on what we've heard during that testimony, what some next steps need to be. Um, so I think we'll have some uh, badly needed clarity um, in about two to three weeks from now. Look at the next one. Um, so you'd mentioned there's two proposals right now for creating a civilian oversight commission, CPAC and GAPA. Um, you'd mentioned that you like elements of both. Um, is there one that you support um, and why? Yeah, so I've co-sponsored both of them as have several of my colleagues. And the way that I look at this is I wholeheartedly support city council passing the strongest possible version of civilian oversight. And both of those ordinances um, have undergone change, not just recently, but over the last several years. And so I think that it's really important to support the grassroots organizers who have come to us asking for our feedback, asking for our support, asking for insights into how we talk with colleagues. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter to me what acronym something has so long as it's the strongest possible version that we can pass. So for me, um, three things that are just absolutely critical to me is that this new entity have final say over policymaking, that it have uh, a budget floor the way that our inspector general's office does, as well as the civilian office police accountability COPA so that if someone is doing a really good job and investigating in a very thorough way um, inappropriate processes and actions that there's not retribution that occurs via reducing their budget. So having that budget floor in place is critical. And then finally, we need to make sure that we have um, robust opportunities to, um, especially like fire our, our, our police superintendent, the COPE administrator, police board members, if they're not getting the job done. Um, historically and, and currently, it's it's something that has been primarily, if not exclusively, the job of the mayor. And we've had a series of mayors where they've known what the issues are. I mean, we all have, but we still find ourselves in the same problematic situation. So unless we flip the script and fundamentally reorient the way that um, uh, public safety occurs and who is reporting to whom, um, and I, I believe that civilians need to be at the center of that, we're just going to have a continuation of the status quo. So my, my hope is that city council can find a really robust option um, and, and, and pass that and that it has those three things that I mentioned along with a number of others and that we continue to dialogue with both groups and just figure out what are the strongest policies that we can bring to bear what are the sorts of things where we might have legal concerns where we need to work through them? Because at the end of the day, I don't want something getting caught up around like questions around legal uh, analysis or policy. We can do that work right now and then get something passed as quickly as possible. I'll take the next question. For years, local advocates like BYP 100 have requested the deletion of the gang database because of the role the surveillance has played in falsely targeting and profiling minorities. Do you see the deletion of all gang databases as part of the proposed changes to Chicago Police Department? 
I think that that's a critical component and is something that we have uh, inspector general's report on where they really called into question how that data was being maintained and used that there were lots of folks, including at CPS who appear to have access and were using that, um, that there were folks who were way too young to be a part of a game, other gang, other folks who were, I think, close to 100 years of age. We also have instances that resulted in lawsuits where someone was improperly placed on the gang database for very dubious reasons and had profoundly negative consequences. And when you recognize that, um, at least historically, we've had federal law enforcement personnel have access to those databases, it's an opportunity to really supercharge the sort of improper and oftentimes unlawful um, immigration activities that administrations like the Trump administration have engaged in. So that report was a huge one. I, along with Alderwoman Jeanette Taylor, introduced an ordinance around um, revisions to the gang database, knowing that um, we need to start with a conversation of how, if at all, that's going to be helpful. Because one of the things that was recommended by the Inspector General's report was a hearing or a series of hearings to talk about whether this is even necessary. Because when you're talking about the ways in which we need to improve trust, um, especially in areas where there was never trust to begin with between the police department and members of those communities, um, folks who feel over-policed, folks who feel like they get on put on these gang databases for bogus reasons or no reasons at all. If we can't have open and honest conversations about whether that data, database is doing more harm than good, and at a minimum, what sort of basic changes need to be made based on what the Inspector General's report has said, we're, we're not doing our job. So um, I, I know that there was an announcement a little while before COVID of a new gang database, a criminal enterprise database, my understanding is that COVID kind of put those plans on hold, that we now have a new police superintendent in the interim. We've actually had two, but this one is, is uh, will be with us probably for a little bit longer than Charlie Beck. And so um, in the fall, um, I, I anticipate that we'll be able to re-engage um, CPD leadership to figure out a path forward working with our grassroots allies. Okay, that could take the next one. So this is actually a question we got from Twitter uh, a couple days ago um, when we asked for some questions there. Um, why, if passed, would CPAC prevent individuals that work for the city of Chicago, specifically in jobs that are not the police department, from running for a seat? Hmm. Um, I'd have to look into that further. So what I will say isn't like based on CPAC specifically, but just how I understand a lot of government positions to operate. So like want to be careful and qualifying it that way, where um, if it's often the case that you cannot have in Chicago anyways, um, two elected, hold two elected positions simultaneously. So to give you just like a personal example, before I was elected to be the older person, the 47th ward, I was a community member on a local school council at my son's elementary school. And so I had to, um, essentially choose which position I was I, I was going to have, um, particularly after I, I won my aldermanic race, so I decided to give up my position on the LSC. Those sorts of um, restrictions are very common. So if you're talking about something like CPAC, which envisions um, the, that residents will directly elect the individuals who will be um, on that civilian board, um, it's, it's, it seems likely to me that there would just be a requirement that you choose one. And, and then one thing I would emphasize too is that um, I know that at least in the version of CPAC that was introduced to city council last fall, um, that it envisions the members of that, of that board uh, to be full-time employees. And I think they would have the same salary as an older person. So um, I think that there's probably just not enough time in the day for someone to work on that board while also continuing to be a municipal employee in another capacity. Great, thank you. This is going to be our last question of the evening. Much of the opposition to police reform comes from white Chicagoans who benefit from racial oppression held up by the police and fear the loss of that privilege. What points or, or, or arguments do you find useful to address that fear? I think a lot of it goes to my, my earlier point around what public safety means to folks and who helps ensure public safety um, occurs and that people feel that way. Um, 
I think it, it, it varies area to area. So just speaking for parts of the 47th Ward, I know a lot of individuals um, feel that, well, we don't have as much police presence as we used to. And in certain areas, maybe that's the case, especially in terms of um, uh, beat officers. But it also might mean that instead of officers previously being on foot patrol, they're instead in cars. And so they're not as readily available to folks in terms of you see an officer, you might wave, say hello, stop and chat for a few minutes. And so a lot of folks um, told me they, they are looking for that sort of relational experience. Um, but when you look at the data in terms of places like the 47th Ward, um, a lot of our statistics are, are, are not increasing in problematic ways. And so I, I think it's important to really paint a vision for what public safety looks like, what someone, um, especially in elected capacity, thinks is the core responsibility for our police department, and then what other entities, be they the fire department, OEMC, um, uh, folks who are helping provide mental health. I mean, it really runs the gamut, um, affordable housing supporters, how that factors into public safety. And so, so long as you have individuals in positions like mine who help feed a narrative that public safety can only be ensured by police officers, as a result of hearing that rhetoric, I think it's gonna to continue to be the case that uh, a lot of residents just think, okay, if, if public safety is not where I want it to be, we need more officers. And it's really gonna be the situation where even in a community where folks feel safe, that they're gonna say, um, uh, well, I don't wanna say rarely, that there will be certain individuals who will not clamor for fewer. I mean, we've, we've had a number of folks reach out saying that um, they, they have concerns around interactions that they've had with police officers recently and in, in, in the past as well. So I think for the folks who have the sort of feeling as was indicated in that, um, in that question, that we have to step up as elected leaders and really tackle that head on to share with them data, to really hear them out and figure out what they're really concerned about and then share our authentically held beliefs around what public safety reform um, looks like going forward. And there might be a difference of opinion on city council and that's fine, I think we should air that out, but let's not shy away from having that conversation because if we do, I think that we'll really have missed an opportunity to acknowledge and affirm what tens if not hundreds of thousands of Chicagoans have been demanding from us, which is a real significant departure from the status quo where the, uh, whereby um, communities of color in particular black men just are not treated with the sort of dignity and respect that we would all want. Thank you. We have um, more questions, but of course we've run out of time. Um, so I was wondering if uh, you wouldn't mind if we sent them to you over email, if you wouldn't mind following up. And Absolutely fine. So folks can send us uh, uh, emails via info at aldermanmartin.com. Um, and we would be happy to field those and get back to folks as quickly as possible. Okay, thank you, awesome. Uh, yes, keep your eyes peeled on your inbox for a list of questions from us. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Um, all right, well, I think, uh, Emily, we're going to switch gears to the civic hacking portion of the evening. Um, for those of you who want to stick around, we have uh, a Zoom uh, call that we're going to be doing shortly after this live stream concludes. Uh, the URL for that is bit.ly slash chn dash remote dash Zoom. Um, and if you would like to join us online, we also have a, a Slack channel that you can invite yourself to uh, you can get to that by going to slackme.chihacknet.org. I think we'll get those both posted as links in the uh, in the live chat. Um, anything else I'm missing, Emily, for us to do? I might be muted. No, I'm not. Great. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for, for joining us. Thanks again to Alderman uh, Martin for uh, his time. Uh, and I think the last thing for us to do, Emily, is our catchphrase. That's right. Ready? Go, Go forth and hack. hack. Always hard to do <laughs> virtually, but we're doing yes. it. We're All doing right. Well, it. thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you over at the uh, at the Zoom call. We'll start in just a minute. Thanks, all. All right.